right. Well, hello, everybody. What's up, South Campus? It's good to be with you today. We've already said hello to our North Campus that's joining us. What's up, North Campus family? All of our family joining us online, wherever you are watching or joining from. And our family over at Upshur County Jail. Come on, let's tell them how much we love them. We love you so much. We are so grateful that you are with us today. As I mentioned to you earlier, we are in a time of 21 days of prayer. And this is the final stretch of that, the final week of that. And so I've been so blessed by seeing the families coming and praying and people getting up early to come and pray. We're going to continue tomorrow at 6.30 a.m. at both campuses. And I'm just going to encourage you to finish strong. I'll tell you, the voice of the enemy will be the loudest when you're getting ready to finish something. He will do everything he can to try to stop you. Like, you know what? You're tired. You deserve to sleep in today. You could pray another day, another time, you know. And uh, that's because you need to get up and pray that day. So when you hear that voice, just be like, not today, Satan, and get up and go, okay? So that's tomorrow, uh, Monday through Friday of this week. And then also this coming weekend, uh, our ladies have an event, our women have an event called The Gathering. And so... Yes, if you're not signed up for that, I don't know what you're waiting for, but uh, it's this weekend, and I know it's going to be an incredible time with God, and so ladies here at the South Campus, and then September 1st, we have a men's night, so men, if you are not signed up for that, I don't know what you're waiting for either. Let me just say this to all of the men, something powerful happens when men gather together to worship God. And I'm just telling you, I believe God has a word for you. Yes, there's going to be some great food there. It costs us $15, and that's just to cover the food because we barbecue. So, uh, yeah, sign up for that, September 1st. You can go on the website and sign up there. But we're in a series, though, today. This is the second week of a series we've been in called I Am, where we're looking at the character and the nature of God. And I think it's important to do that because we live in a culture today, if we're being honest, and even has kind of maybe crept into the church a little bit, where we're pretty consumed with ourselves, where we talk, we like to talk a lot about who we are. We like to explore everything about us, and that's not necessarily bad. I believe in you finding out your strengths and your personality, and people go to such degrees where they know every Enneagram number, every personality test they've taken, every strength. We want to know everything about ourselves, right? Because we think somehow we'll find the answers we're looking for. But I just want to encourage you today, the answer is not in knowing more about yourself. The answer is in knowing more about God. And when you know more about who he is, then you can kind of understand more about who you are. And so that's what we're doing is we're looking at our God and the character and the nature of our God. And last week we talked about his personal name, Yahweh. He identified himself and which means I am the God who was, I'm the God who is, and I'm the God who will be. And it speaks to his consistency, and he is faithful. And just who he is that we're reading here in Exodus is who he is going to be forever. And that should bring great comfort to you today, is that we have an unchanging, amazing God. But I want to jump back into the passage today in Exodus chapter 34, the kind of the theme passage for us. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm actually going to read it to you today out of the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, because the the phrase I'm going to highlight, this is the closest it is in the original Hebrew. So let's read this together. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, this is Moses. Remember, Moses asked to see the glory of God. And the Lord cried out or proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands and who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and to worship. That's an old English way of saying the boy fell down and just began to worship God. That's what happens when you see fully who God is, when you understand more about his character and his nature. And really, that's a part of my prayer for our church in this series, is that as we see who he is more clearly, that the result would be our hearts would just worship God. And that is what I'm praying for you today. But as we look at this passage again, think about this. Of all of the ways that God could have described himself when he gave his name, 
He could have said, I am Yahweh, the all-powerful one, the almighty one, the omnipotent one, the supreme being of the universe. That's probably what I would have done. I would have been like, hear me roar, you ants, and I am God, and you don't even know how weak you are. Like, he didn't do that, though. He could have said any of those things. But look at the attributes and the adjectives that he used to describe himself and how he treats people. They're, they're all about people. I'm compassionate. I'm gracious. I'm slow to anger. I'm filled with unfailing love. This should give us a major insight into the God that we serve, that he is all about people. And if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we're made in the image of God. That should ask us, do we reflect this nature and character of God to other people? When people look at us, do they see people who are compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and filled with love? Because that's what they should see if this God is living inside of us. We're supposed to reflect who he is. And of all of the ways he could have described himself, this is how he's choosing to describe himself. It gives me just such, uh, such a greater picture into the heart of our God today. And I want to look at today two of, uh, two of the words that he used there. And in Hebrew, they're best translated compassionate and gracious, okay? This is the first two words after saying his name Yahweh that he would describe himself as. And now, if you remember last week, I gave you a number of verses, and you can read about this throughout the Old Testament and Psalm and Joel and, and Nehemiah, all of these times where this, this particular phrase is repeated, this description of God is repeated over and over again through generations of who he was. And God said this in Exodus 33, 19, just previously one chapter to Moses. Look at what he said using these same two words. He said, I myself will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord to you. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll show compassion on whom I want to show compassion to. In other words, he's saying, there are going to be people that you don't think deserve compassion and grace, but I'm God of graciousness and compassion. And I'll show it to who I want to. And I'm telling you, there are people today I can look at and go, they don't deserve it, Lord. And he's like, you don't understand who I am then. I'm the God of compassion, and I'm the God of grace. And so I want to look at the first one, and that is he is the God of compassion. Man, I'm so grateful that we have a compassionate God. I'm so grateful today that we serve a God who is full of compassion for people. In fact, the word in Hebrew there is the word rahum. And I want to use their, those words because it really gives a greater picture into the word compassion. And that word rahum comes from a Hebrew root word that means womb. Now, this is fascinating. Womb. Think about it. So when God is saying I'm compassionate, it has a, a maternal connotation to it. Okay? Now, some of you, I'm, I'm starting to lose you a minute. So hang on here. Because God, remember, he created male and female in his image. We're both created in the image of God. Okay? Now, God is not a mother. He is a father. But he has all the best attributes of a mother because we were made in his image. He's not made in our image, which means he's the best of all of us put together. It's him. Okay. So I just want to make it clear. I'm not saying God is a mother or has a womb, but he's giving the picture when he talks about himself of a womb. Now, I don't know what it's like to carry a baby in a womb. Praise God. That's what I've said. Thank you, brother, for agreeing with me there. I've never once wished I could do that. Thank God for women. I'm a biological male. I cannot have, it's in, I'm incapable, okay, of having a baby. I do not have a womb, okay? I'm just making sure you know that today. Now, I have carried a food baby. And when my wife first got pregnant with our first child, uh, actually, she tried this with all of them, but for sure the first one, she was trying to make me eat all this stuff, and, and I realized she said, I'm trying to get you fat like me. Like I'm, it's called sympathy weight, right? And so I'm a good husband, and I just wanted to do whatever my wife needed me to. So your boy carried and delivered a food baby as well. But, but I don't know what that's like, okay? I, really, I don't know what it's like. But moms... If you've carried a baby in your womb, it kind of changes your world. You're kind of preoccupied all the time with that baby. 
There's probably not a day that you wake up when you're pregnant and go, oh, I forgot I was pregnant today. <laughs> Never happened. Because it changes everything about you. It changes your life. It changes the way you sleep. It changes what you eat. You start taking prenatal vitamins. It changes the clothing you wear, right? It changes everything. You're preoccupied with this baby. Now think about this. God is using this imagery when he is showing us who he is, that he's a nurturing God. While he's a God of compassion, he's a, nur- he's a father, but he is nurturing and caring. He is the best of both. Tandra is far more nurturing than me by nature, okay? Mothers normally are more nurturing by nature. Like when a baby is crying, a mother is nurturing. Fathers are not. We're just like, get it to be quiet. Like, what do we have to do? And I thought, I thought about a comedian I heard once talking about when they first had their baby, the doctor gave them the baby, and they were about to go home, and he said, listen, whatever you do, don't shake this baby. You're going to want to shake this baby. And he's thinking, what is this guy talking about? Then he gets home, and it's the middle of the night, and he's sleep-deprived, and he's holding the baby who's crying, and he's like, did the doctor say, shake this baby or don't <laughs> shake this baby, right? We just want it to stop. But a mother, a mother knows the cries of their babies. They, they can, from seven blocks away, they can hear a cry and be like, that's a hurt cry. That, that's a sad cry. They're, they need comfort. That, that's a hungry cry. They know the cries of their children. And this is the picture of, of who God is. He's saying, I, I'm the God who knows the cries of my children. I'm the God that understands exactly what they need. In fact, in Psalm 34, 17, David says it this way. The Lord hears his people when they call for him for help, and he rescues them from all of his troubles, their troubles. He, he's the God that understands exactly why we're crying and exactly what we need. And because of the compassionate nature of our God, compassion always moves you to something. And so I want to show you three things that the compassion of God moves him to do, okay? So here's the first one. The compassion of God moves him to comfort us. Kind of like I mentioned earlier, when a baby cries, just like a mother comforts their crying child, we have a God who will comfort us. And humanity sometimes can feel like nobody sees what's going on. We can often feel like we're, we're crying alone and the, the pain that we're experiencing, nobody understands it, no one sees it. Yet the scripture says in Psalm 56, 8, that you keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all of my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one of them in your book. This scripture actually gives me great comfort knowing that there's never been a time that I've been suffering and my God didn't see it. There's never been a time that I've been crying and he didn't take note of it in his book and say, I see what you're going through, son. I see what you're going through, daughter. He knows every pain that you've had. He knows every thought that you've had. And he was there the whole time. You're not... Alone in that, in the compassion of our God, sees people in their pain, but doesn't just see them in their pain, it comes to comfort them. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 49, this language would be used, uh, and look at verse 13, it says, Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, O mountains. Why? For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. His compassion towards those who are suffering moves him to come and comfort his people. This is a promise we have in Scripture. And I know there's, there's people today who feel like they don't have someone to comfort them, but our God is so good. He's given you the Holy Spirit, who one of the Holy Spirit's name is the Comforter who comes alongside you to comfort you in your pain. It's like a mother that wraps her arms around her child and says, it's going to be okay. We have a God who will wrap his arms around you and say, I see you in your pain, and it's going to be okay. That should bring you comfort today. That's what the compassion of God does. Here's the second thing the compassion of God moves him to do, is it moves him to care for us. Now, this is a little bit different. Comfort is more of a consoling, but a care, just like a mother takes care of her children, is going to provide for, it's going to tend to, it's going to meet the needs. This is the same imagery that God is using. In fact, a couple of verses later in Isaiah 49, 15, says this, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Yet even if these may forget you, but I will never forget you. In other words, A mother who's nursing or taking care of her child would never forget about it. 
But even if natural women could forget their children, and sometimes they do, I will never forget you. I will always care for you. And this is important for us today because a lot of people feel abandoned. There's a lot of people who don't feel cared for. They grew up in a home where where maybe with an absentee parent, whether a father or a mother, and they think that there, there was no one there to care for me and there will no one ever be there to care for me. It's called an orphan spirit. And it's prevalent in our culture today. And what God is saying when he is introducing himself and saying, I'm the God of compassion, he is saying, not only do I comfort you in your pain, I will never forget you. I will always care for you. Just as a mother cares for her nursing child, I will care for you. I will meet your needs, which is why Peter could say this in 1 Peter 5, 7. He says, cast your cares upon God. Why? Because he cares for you. Cast your worries, cast your anxieties, cast your needs upon God because we have a God that knows them and will tend to them and will care for you. That's the nurturing nature of our God. Just use the imagery of a womb again. A baby in a womb has no worries. It has no cares because it's already in an environment that it's going to be taken care of. God is using this picture to show his great care for you and for I. He has this kind of compassion. In fact, his compassion moved him all the time to care for the children of Israel, who certainly did not deserve it. (laughs) Even in the wilderness, think about this. They had a bunch of needs, but every single need was met. They were hungry, he provided food. He provided manna. They got tired of manna, he provided quail. So much quail, they got sick of quail. They complained about having too much quail. I've never complained about having too much steak. That's just what I'm saying, because I've never had too much. But they didn't complain. I mean, he, he, they did complain, and he still gave it to them. He gave them water in the desert right out of a rock. They were, they were there for 40 years, and their clothes did not wear out. Even the detail to take care of their clothes... God was saying, I will care for every single thing that you need. I am the God who has compassion and cares for you. There's no one more compassionate than Yahweh. And we live in a culture today where people try to act more compassionate than God. Well, I don't know why God does that, but there's no one more compassionate than God. Nobody sees you more and cares for you more than our God. And this was embodied in Jesus When Jesus came to the earth, he often, the Bible says, was moved with compassion. Over and over again, you can read about it. He saw crowds. He saw them hurting. He saw them suffering. He saw them hungry. And he was moved with compassion. One such place is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were confused and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. He saw their need and his compassion moved them. In fact, that word compassion in the Greek, while it's rahum in Hebrew, it means womb, in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, it's the word splachnitsomai. And that's a fun word to say. Splachnitsomai. You might just say it for fun sometime. Don't say it towards someone's face because typically you spit, but splachnitsomai. And what, it's a deep like deep from the bowels, like deep inside. It's something that moves you so deep, you have to do something about it. It's more than just a feeling bad for, like a sympathy, like having pity. It's something deep inside, even deeper than empathy, that moves you to do something about it. This is the same word that Jesus, it was used to describe Jesus when he had compassion on people. It moved him. The compassion of God moves God. The compassion of Jesus moved Jesus. And it's that same compassion that ought to move us to care for what God cares about. In fact, Jesus tells the story to help us get a picture into, I think, not only his compassion, but the compassion we're supposed to have. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Most of you have probably heard this story. It's a story of a man that went on a journey. And on his way on the journey, he gets robbed and he gets beat up and he gets left for dead there. And who comes along? A priest and a Levite. That's a pastor and a worship leader, okay? The religious of the day. 
They came by and they stepped to the other side of the road. They wouldn't have anything to do with the man that was hurting. Yet a Samaritan, someone who was considered less than the Jews, someone who was considered to be like a dog to them, they didn't associate together. They were of a different culture, probably a different race. They can't, the Samaritan passes, and the Bible says he's moved with compassion for the man. So he comes, he has to do something about it, even though it was probably taboo. He came and he picked him up. He bandaged his wounds. He picked him up, he put him on his, on his camel or donkey, and he took him to an inn, and he paid for the innkeeper to keep him. And he told the innkeeper, if that's not enough money, when I come back, I'll pay for whatever charges he incurs. This is the picture of compassion, where you can't sit by and do nothing. You must do something. That's the picture of our God when he sees us in our pain. He comes for us, and he comforts us, and that leads us to the third one. He doesn't just comfort us and care for us. The compassion of God moves him to come for us. Just like the good Samaritan had to get down and do something about it, we serve a God who did something about it. He constantly rescued and came for the Israelites over and over and over again. But his compassion moved him so much so that he became one of us. He stepped out of heaven, stepped out of divinity, became flesh and came to this earth. And he understands what we go through. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 4, we have a high priest who can sympathize and empathize with us because he became one of us. He went through everything that we went through, which is why he came to earth to rescue us. He didn't sit up in heaven and say, oh, that, that's so bad for you. No, he came for us. And this is the whole purpose that Jesus came for, to rescue us. In fact, he used this similar language of a mother and child in Luke 13. When he said, oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks. I wanted to bring you in and I came to rescue you. I came to protect you. He sees us and he came to rescue us out of our sin, out of our pain, out of our suffering. In fact, this is one of the greatest scriptures to me in the Bible is Romans chapter 5 verse 6. It says, when we were utterly helpless, when you could do nothing about it, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Think about that imagery, when you were utterly helpless. Why, did, why was Jesus moved with compassion? Because they were helpless. Like a child who is helpless without their mother or their father, that's you and I. And Here's probably part of the problem is today is probably we don't understand our helplessness. And if you don't understand your helplessness, you will never understand the compassion of God. Until you understand how helpless you and I really are, we will never understand how much his compassion has moved him to care for us. And you won't understand the second thing he said, and that's, I'm the God of grace. He is the God of grace. And in this passage... The reason I chose the one today I chose in ASB is because mercy and grace are both used there interchangeably. But there is a difference. In this particular passage in Hebrew, the, the word is hanun, and it, it is a grace. The word is grace, and it carries with it this beautiful Hebrew picture of a gift, a beautiful gift that is given. It, it, instead, it's like a gift that's given from someone of higher status to someone of lower status and it's a gift that is undeserved and it's the gift that lifts you could say grace is a gift that lifts and gives something that cannot be earned or deserved and even the picture of a higher status to lower status reminds us of who God is and who we are and how we don't deserve this grace that he has given us but it is a gift and in the bible when you read the scriptures There is no one in Scripture that is described with more graciousness and grace than God. There is no one more gracious than our God. And no word is used more to describe him than grace when looking all throughout Scripture on this. But think about the context when he says this. The children of Israel had just been rescued out of Egypt. He brought them to a safe place. He made an eternal covenant with them. And what did did they do? He goes up on the mountain with Moses, remember? And A.A. Ron was messing it all up down low. Okay? The, this is the thing that they had just, they had made a golden calf to worship. And what is his response? 
I'm the God of compassion, and I'm the God of grace. They didn't deserve it. They had just made idols to worship. And he's saying, I'm telling you who I am. I'm the God of compassion, and I am the God of grace. Now, there's a difference, like I told you, between grace and mercy. God is both of them, by the way. God is a merciful God and a gracious God. But grace is getting something that you don't deserve, while mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. And they're both needed. See, I can show my kids mercy by not disciplining them for something they did wrong. Like they they could do something wrong and I could say, I'm going to show you mercy by not grounding you or not spanking you or not disciplining you in some way. That's mercy. But grace goes a step further. Grace says, not only am I not going to give you what you do deserve, I'm going to give you a gift you don't deserve and you couldn't earn in any way. It's like if a person broke into my house and they were robbing me and stealing my food, and I catch them. Mercy is saying, I'm not going to call the cops on you. But grace is saying, sit at my table while I make something to eat for you so I can give you a better step out of here, a better life going forward. That's the picture of God's mercy and his grace for us. It's more than just not receiving punishment. It's receiving the gift of new life through him. That's why Paul could say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not of your own doing, but it is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. The reason it's not a result of works is because you're helpless to earn the grace of God. You cannot do it. None of us deserve it. And just like the Israelites, they were already worshiping another God when he came down off the mountain and told them, I'm the God of grace and mercy and compassion. And sometimes I think we can read these stories, we can read about the Israelites, and we can go, those guys, they don't deserve it. I would never make a golden calf. And maybe you wouldn't make a graven image, but you need to understand you were already worshiping yourself. All of us worship our own gratification. We all, until Jesus, we were worshiping something else. And even today, there's a temptation to worship status, to worship money, to worship relationships, to worship sports, to worship entertainment, to worship something else we think that will care for us and comfort us. But God was saying, no, no, you're helpless without me. And it is this good grace that he gave us. And what was the culmination of that compassion and grace? It's Jesus. Jesus is the compassion of God and the grace of God in the flesh. Jesus is the result of the compassion of God sending someone to earth and the sacrifice of the grace of God to die for us when we couldn't earn it or deserve it. We were stuck. And there was only one way out. And that was Jesus. Why do you think that God uses this word to say, I'm a God of compassion and grace? Why? Why is he so full of compassion? Why is he so full of grace? Because he's a relational God. And because he wants a relationship with you. It's the story of the Bible. It's a story of scripture. All from the beginning is how God relentlessly pursues a relationship with with humanity that continually turns its back on him. You can read cover to cover throughout scripture and you can see how he continually shows favor even when we betray him, even when we ignore him. The story of the Bible is how the God of the universe finds ways over and over again to reconcile with a hard-hearted humanity. And that is why he can say, I'm the God of compassion and I'm the God of grace. Because even though you've turned your back on me, I'm going to still come for you. I'm going to still send my son. Even though I know you won't accept him, some of you, I'm still going to send him to rescue you. And as I prepared this week, I just looked at my own life. And I've seen the compassion of God and the grace of God on my life so much. I couldn't earn it can't deserve it in any way but yet he still freely gives it to me and he still freely gives it to you and the picture I saw of all this together is found in in, in Psalm 40 
Verse 1 and 2, when David said, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. He turned to me. He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a solid ground, and he steadied me as I walked alone. That's the picture of compassion. I heard you. I hear you. I'm coming for you. I'm picking you up out of that. He picked you up out of addiction. He picked you up out of depression. He picked you up out of the bondage of sin. I want you to experience this grace. I want you to experience his grace. Some of you feel stuck today. You don't have to be stuck. Some of you feel forgotten today. You're not forgotten today. You have a God that sees you, that hears you. But more than that, he did something about it and he came for you. Amen. How many of you say, I'm grateful for the compassion and the grace of God. Would you stand up with me today? I want to take a minute and just thank God because if, if you see who he is and you don't thank him, you've missed it. You've missed it. So today, can we just go to the Lord in prayer? Would you bow your heads with me? And just in your own words, just tell him how grateful you are. God, thank you. Thank you for your compassion. God. It goes so much more than just seeing us and saying, I'm sorry you're hurting. But you, you record them and you come for us. And you comfort us and you sent Jesus to save us. I'm so grateful. Just tell him how grateful you are. And God, I'm asking through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would move on us, that we, God, would be moved with compassion for people the way you are. God, let us be image bearers of Christ. Let us be moved with compassion and grace. Break our hearts for the things that break yours. What breaks your heart is people. God, move our hearts for people today. I feel the compassion of God for people today. With every head bowed and every eye closed at both campuses, maybe you're here today and you've never experienced this. You've not exper truly experienced the grace and the compassion of God. And just because grace is available doesn't mean you've received it. It's a gift. You have to receive a gift. And it comes with an exchange of your life where you say, I'm giving up my life to receive the grace of a new life in him. And as I was thinking about this today, the Bible tells us that all of our days are numbered. There will be a day where it's too late to call out for the grace of God. And I believe it's the compassion of God that he hasn't come back yet. It's the compassion of God that you're here today. The Bible says that he is slow in his return because he doesn't want anyone to suffer. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So I believe it's the compassion of God that he's given you a chance to receive his grace today. And I think it would be not compassionate of me to not give you that opportunity. So I'm going to just, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're saying, I don't have this relationship with Jesus. I've not received this grace from him. I'm not, I've not given him my life and I'm not serving this God. If that's you... I just want you to slip your hand up at both campuses and just say, that's me. I, wanna, I want you to receive this gift of grace today. Who else am I talking to? I see a couple. Anybody else? Anybody else would say, that's me today. I want to pray for you. Okay. All right, North Campus, I'm going to give you your service back, and your campus pastors are going to pray with you there. But I'm going to lead you guys in prayer here. And let's just pray this together for those that are making this decision for Jesus for the first time. Just say, Jesus, I come to you. I receive your grace. I can't earn it. I'm helpless without you. I need you today. I give you my life. I turn from worshiping the things I've worshiped before. And I choose to follow you. I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those that made that decision?